when I handle cases like this, the first question is always, how well does everybody get along? Can we at least work together toward a resolution without fighting, even if we don't agree on what the resolution should be? Or are we starting out with a hostile circumstance? And oftentimes you can manage that before it gets to somebody like me through, as you said, proper estate planning and proper planning. Welcome to Absolute Trust Talk with your host, Kirsten Howe. Absolute Trust Talk brings you tips, tools, advice, and interviews to help you build a reliable knowledge base on estate planning, business, and finance to start preparing for your future today. Hello and welcome to Absolute Trust Talk. I'm Kirsten Howe and I'm the host today of our live streaming podcast here at Absolute Trust Council. It feels like it's been a while since I've been here. I think Madison hosted our last episode. So it's nice to be back. It's the end of the year, 2023, almost Christmas time. Ho, ho, ho. And I'm very excited about today's episode. There are a couple of reasons. We have clients who have issues with real estate, with neighbors all the time. And I think it will be really interesting and fun to talk to our expert here, Stephen Kahn, who I will introduce more formally in a minute about how those kinds of problems get resolved. And there's been recently, not too long ago in the news, a particular case in our backyard at the foot of Mount Diablo, a dispute between some bicyclists and the property owner about a little shortcut that has been in use for a long time. And maybe we can get Stephen's, you know, opinion about what's going to happen in that case or what might happen in that case. Anyway, so the kinds of disputes we're talking about, fence lines, views, what about, this is one we see commonly in our practice, children inherit property together and they don't want to own it together. So how do we resolve those kinds of things? First, before I bring Stephen on, I'm just going to remind everyone that if you have a question and you are watching me or us live, go ahead and type it into the comment section and we will attempt to answer it. If you want to refer a friend to watch this episode, this episode and all of our episodes and a whole lot of other really good information can be found on our website, absolutetrustcouncil.com, or maybe you just want to watch this again. So go ahead and do it if you're a fan. All right. Now I am going to bring my guest on and introduce him. My guest today is Stephen Kahn. Stephen is a civil litigation attorney. He focuses on real estate and business disputes that involve real estate. He is a Northern California super lawyer for years. And before that, he was a Northern California super lawyer rising star for years. So you get the idea. He's a very good lawyer, lots of experience, over 19 years of experience doing trials, doing arbitrations, just problem solving in general. The thing that he tries to do as not all litigators do, but he really tries to help his clients avoid litigation because nobody's really happy at the end of litigation. But if he has to, he will do battle for his clients. His specialty really is disputes involving ownership, use, control of real estate. So it could be leases, it could be quiet title, it could be title insurance issues. He represents real estate professionals, so, you know, realtors. He represents buyers and sellers. He also does some transactional work, so he drafts and negotiates deals involving real estate. But today we're going to talk about the dispute side of his practice. Stephen, welcome. I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you very much, Kirsten. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and your audience about hopefully problem solving real estate disputes, but if it works its way up to a real dispute in court, we can talk about what those disputes look like in my world, how we solve them during litigation, through litigation, and how we avoid it in the first place. And we'll talk about some of the examples you gave, common scenarios where it starts with somebody in your world, somebody in your practice, and then they get the property and it might end up in my world. Right, (laughs) yeah. Yes, and I am grateful to have you in my, what we used to call Rolodex, (laughs) for when my clients need you. All right. So as I said, we're going to talk about some of the more common real estate disputes that we see amongst our clients. Most of our clients own real estate. You know, most people own their home, if not any other real estate. And probably most of our listeners also own real estate. So these things come up. And the first one 
that this is one that we see and we try to avoid through good estate planning, but we don't always manage to avoid it. The scenario I'm talking about is two siblings or three siblings. They inherit a piece of real estate from their parents and maybe they don't want to own it at all. And so that's probably not a problem, but maybe one of them wants to own it and the others don't, or maybe everybody wants to own it, but they just don't want to own it together, (laughs) which, you know, that raises its own issues. So what are the options? What can they do about that? Well, assuming that they don't all get along on what should be done with the real estate, whether it's holding it together or not holding it together, since it's a family issue, there's usually a lot of emotion involved. When I handle cases like this, the first question is always, how well does everybody get along? Can we at least work together toward a resolution without fighting? even if we don't agree on what the resolution should be? Or are we starting out with a hostile circumstance? And oftentimes you can manage that before it gets to somebody like me through, as you said, proper estate planning and proper planning. So at the front end, when we're talking about what's going to happen with, let's say I'm writing a trust for my real estate, what's going to happen with it when I pass? It may sound nice, oh, I'll give it to my son and my daughter in equal shares. That makes equitable sense, but perhaps they're not going to get along when you pass. Perhaps they don't get along and then they've got a 50-50 ownership situation and they don't know what to do. They have remedies through court, which is expensive, risky, stressful. They could work together to reach a resolution, like you said, selling the house or some other solution. But either way, at the front end, there might be a way to mitigate that. For instance, Maybe, and I'll make this up, maybe mom has a house worth a million bucks and she has assets worth a million bucks and she wants her estate to go to each of them. Maybe she gives one of them the house and one of them the assets so that they're not fighting about it after the fact rather than fighting about how to split a house. And we'll talk a little bit about what I mean when I say split a house because under the law, it can literally have to be split or figuratively have to be split through a court process. Neither of those are very fun. They're both stressful and they're both taking control out of the trust or the beneficiaries of the trustee's hands and putting it into the court, the control of a court or somebody else who's going to decide for you, which is never fun. Right. That's what we're always trying to avoid is make your own choices and (laughs) don't leave it up to a judge. Yeah. Who doesn't know anything about you or what you want. That's right. Yeah. So, okay. So assuming this worst case where they end up actually owning it together for whatever reason, they can't negotiate that away. The planning just isn't going to work out. So brother and sister, they own a piece of real estate together and one of them wants out. They just want out. I don't want to, I don't want to be a landlord anymore or whatever, or I don't, want to own the property with you, (laughs) my brother. If that happens, there's pretty much two paths. Path one would be negotiate a buyout of the person who doesn't want to be there. That is still a potentially hostile discussion, but it's not in court. So you might hire a lawyer and say, "I, I want out. I want my fair share. And both sides have a dialogue about, well, what's that fair share worth? They could hire an appraiser and each submit competing appraisals. They could hire a mediator, which is usually a retired lawyer or a retired judge who helps them in a confidential, non-binding way reach a solution. But if they can't get it that way, then it probably lands with somebody like me, and I will file what's called a partition lawsuit, partition, which under the law like literally means partitioning or splitting up the property. Now, most of the time, the real estate is not something that could be easily physically split up. Right. For instance, a house can't be cut in half. Right. Uh, in, In olden days, it was usually a parcel of land, and it wasn't that hard to envision drawing a line down the middle and giving one piece to one person and one piece to the other person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But if there's a house, yeah. Yeah. If there's a house, you have in the middle of it. Yeah. (laughs) Typically, it's mom's house or dad's house, and you can't split it up. And so you go and you file a partition lawsuit. And what that means is that's a right that any co owner has. You don't have to own 50%. You could even own 1% of the property, but you can file a partition lawsuit where you raise your hand and you say to the court, I want out, I want my fair share, and I want to be able to sell it. That's a very strong right that a co-owner has. And it's not uncommon when children inherit a piece of property and it's either distributed to them out of a trust or maybe they were on title and their parent who was a co-owner passes away and it goes to them. One of them wants out and they file this lawsuit. How does that work? Recently, the law changed a lot. 
probably in a good way. And the short version of it is you file the lawsuit, you have the right to get your fair share, and the court will go through a process where first it decides who owns what, so how, what percentage do you own, what percentage does the other person own. Typically, that's not in dispute. Then we get to the right. fun part, which is, well, how much do I get? And a recent change under the law is you have the right, if you are the non-contesting party, so let's say you got two kids, one wants to sell, one doesn't want to sell, the person who doesn't want to sell, they have the right to buy out the other one first at fair market value before the court goes through the process of selling it at market or deciding who owns what. That's a recent change to the law in California, but I think a very helpful change. It's designed to accomplish two things. One, to avoid going through the entire court process if the other owner wants to keep the property. Right. And also to be fair to the other owners who don't want to sell the property so that they, they get their fair share. Right, right. Yeah. It might so that, be important yeah. to them to keep it and just yeah, get so rid of this one owner. Yeah. I think the, the big picture message for your viewers and your listeners is there is a remedy built in through the statute. There is a remedy built into the court process where the person who doesn't want to go through this will get their opportunity to buy out the other one who wants out. And the person who wants out will get their offer, has the right to sell their interest and probably will have an opportunity to sell it to the other owner first at market value. And when I say market value, the court has a process for retaining an appraiser, deciding what the property is worth, and then assigning a value to that and offering the other person an opportunity to buy it. And I'm, I'm intentionally oversimplifying the process because that's how it works. Okay. So... They could have done all of that privately with a mediator or not just themselves. But now there is a court process that will say, OK, non-contesting owner, if you want to keep the property, this is the price you're going to pay. Correct. The court determines that through its process. The court determines that through the process, which includes involving an appraiser. So the, the judge won't do it him or herself. The the judge sure. will usually involve really? an appraiser. And there's a, there's a process written into the statute on, on how that works. But let's say that doesn't work out. And and the, the person, yeah, they yeah. don't want to do that. They don't want to buy it. <laughs> but if they don't want to buy it, well, then the process continues and the court will decide who gets what money when the property is eventually sold. And it's not as simple as I'm 50% owner, therefore I get 50% of the proceeds. Because then the court starts thinking about, did either of them spend money for the benefit of the common interest in the property? So mm -hmm. let's say, for instance, you and I receive a property from somebody and we're 50-50 owners. You continue to live in the house rent-free, but you're also paying the mortgage, the carrying costs. You're making upgrades to the property that might allow you to rent part of it out to somebody. Eventually, I file a lawsuit against you for partition, Kristen, and I want my fair share. And you raise your hand and you say, well, okay, I, I guess that's how it's going to go. But the court needs to take into consideration all the money I've spent for the common good and account for that when it's splitting the proceeds. So I'm going to get credit for, for things that help the common interest. And that's where the, I say the action is in those lawsuits, which means the litigation, because we fight about, well, was it really necessary for the property? Uh, right. You know, yeah. Kristen, you, you have an affinity for gold-plated uh, cat photos, for instance. <laughs> you might think that that's great for the property, but a court and me might say that's just, yeah. that's a better yeah, bet, not yeah. really for the common good, you know? Yeah, I could imagine that there's a lot of back and forth on those kinds of issues. Yeah. Okay. But it eventually it's for the court to decide, this is the credit you're going to get or a reimbursement or however you phrase it. And then an order is issued saying this property will now be sold. Correct. And this is what owner A gets and this is what owner B gets when it's sold. Something like that. Percentages, uh, a realtor will be engaged and uh, usually the property will be sold on the open market in that circumstance. Does the, does the court designate the realtor? In other words, the parties argue about that in court too? I would imagine so. They're going to... They, they may they, or they may not. They could. Yeah, they could. That's right. They could have a fight about who the best realtor is. The court ultimately has the discretion to decide who that person is. Some realtors have made a nice recent cottage industry for themselves of being those realtors who get appointed by the court to handle partitions, which is a cool idea. But oftentimes that's not where a lot of the fighting should be. If you're at that point, everybody understands that the property is getting sold. Yeah. And it's not going to make that much difference who the realtor is, I would imagine. But well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe it does. <laughs> I don't want to insult any of my realtor colleagues. Yeah. They all do a great job, I'm sure. They do. They okay. do. Okay. 
So let's talk about another fun dispute that I have had clients get into. I'm going to just call it generally a boundary dispute. So for example, I have been living in my house for 15, 20 years. And uh, when I moved in, you know, the backyard was fenced. I assume that whole backyard was mine because there was a fence around it. And then a new neighbor moves in and hires a surveyor and discovers that actually my back fence is in his backyard. And so now, now what do we do? Now what do we do? I've been doing those cases my entire career and it's a common thing. And it's particularly common if you are inheriting a property from somebody because oftentimes when, as people approach um, the later phases of their life, they're not gonna wanna spend money to find out where a fence is located. They know they're not gonna wanna spend money to move the fence, looks good to them and that's totally okay. But then new people move in and might feel an, entitled or empowered to get a survey and, and find out. And then they find out that the fence is in the wrong place. So what do you do? I truly believe the worst thing you can do is hire a lawyer immediately because lawyers, <laughs> lawyers make the situation. They um, heat it up. They, they yeah. heat it up. It, even if I send the nicest or most anodyne email, just saying, hey, I'm the lawyer. What can I do? The presence of an attorney involved yeah. escalates the tension. Yeah. So yeah. the first step is make sure you know where the stuff is and try to have a friendly dialogue with the neighbor. Usually they don't know. They don't know that the fence is in the wrong place. And I'll give you a real example because I have this case right now where my client bought a property and discovered that the fence was about eight feet into her backyard. And she called me up because she's a longtime client and said, what do I do? And I said, well, first figure out what's on the other side of the fence. If you want to move that fence, is that going to impact your neighbor's daily life? Do they have a structure built there? Do they have something that's important? And in this case, they have a very old mature fruit tree. And I told my client, Probably they're not going to want to cut that down. Probably they're not going to want to have a fence blocking them from access to that. Consider that before you have a discussion with them. And then when you do, think about solutions. Could you have an agreement to put the fence somewhere different than the true property line? Could you have it jog around? Could you buy that land from them? There are all sorts of potential solutions. And I think most of them are informed by not the law, but the emotion of whether or not the, the person on the other side has any sort of emotional attachment to that land or not. If it's a bunch of bushes and they've never been able to access it, they're probably not going to care. And if they do care, you have to ask yourself, well, are you just trying to get stuff for free because you didn't know about it? Th these things matter. Uh -huh. So those are the non-legal responses I start with. Okay. So if it can't be worked out, then they come to you and you're not hiding behind your client. You have to come out into the open and pursue your client's rights. So the survey tells us where the property line actually is. Correct. And is that the end of the conversation? Like that's what I bought and that's what I own. And May somehow this needs to get worked out. Ideally, yes, but as is often the case in our, our legal world, the answer is usually maybe. So first, <laughs> a, an important point for everybody, when you bought your house, you probably got a title insurance policy, right. and I'll come back to that in a minute. And it probably has something attached to it called an assessor's parcel map. It looks like a map of your neighborhood. Okay. That map doesn't yeah. actually show you where your boundaries are. It's a map that's created by the taxing authority to generally have an idea of how big your land is. It's not oh, a survey. Okay. So I've often seen people who use that assessor map and say, my boundaries are according to this. And I say, maybe, but that document can't be relied on. So you need, mm. to, you need to have a real surveyor come out and that surveyor will locate the boundaries of the property, mark the location in the ground so that everybody can see where it is. Once you have that survey, back to title insurance, if, if you have a title insurance policy that applies to the property, consider making a claim Many policies do have coverage for fence being in the wrong place and somebody else oh. claiming an interest okay. because of that. You got to okay. look at the policy and there's all, I, I won't make this into a title sure. insurance discussion, yeah. but just a pointer to don't forget about that. That's something that could be relevant and there's no harm in making a claim. Worst thing that happens is yeah, the title company no. says, no, yeah. no, no coverage. Not covered. Yeah. And then we have a discussion about what can you do next? Generally speaking, under California law, you cannot take somebody's property from them by putting up a fence. There's a long line of cases that say that's not right, that's not fair, because of course it's not fair. 
Otherwise, right. we would just have people putting fences wherever they want. But the law is <laughs> kind of the opposite of that. It says fences can't be used to create exclusive rights in somebody else's property. It doesn't mean you don't have an argument, but the reality is, is that that won't win the day. The fence has been there for a long time. Therefore, that's where the boundary is. Now, there okay. is one exception to that that I'll talk to you about in a minute. Okay. But so I'm just going to interrupt here because I remember a phrase from when I took the bar exam, which was, you know, 175 years ago, adverse possession. And this is sort of sounding like that, but based on conversations that you and I have had before, I know that you're going to say doesn't apply in this situation. So talk to me about that. Adverse possession doesn't apply when you've got fences. The concept of adverse possession is, is pretty basic. I've been using part of your land for my benefit for the, a certain amount of time in a certain way, and therefore I've established the right to continue doing that. And I'll go to court and I'll get a judge to confirm that I have the right to do that. Best example of adverse possession or prescriptive easement, we're really talking about prescriptive easements as well, but best example of that would be having a right to walk across somebody's front lawn to get to your backyard. Adverse possession and prescriptive easements are two different things. The easement is a right to do something. Adverse possession is actually owning someone Ownership. else's land. Yeah. And there's a critical difference between the two. Adverse possession requires that you pay the property taxes on the land that you're claiming. So this is where the, there may be an exception to the fence concept, which is if you go to the taxing authority and you can prove that the authority that you were paying the taxes on that land on the other side of the boundary, on your side of the fence, you may have an argument. You may have an argument for adverse possession. In my career, I have never, never ever seen. <laughs> seen a situation where the fence is the boundary that the tax assessor was using for right. deciding which land to tax. In yeah. all circumstances, it's the opposite, that the fence is there, but the taxing authority is taxing the correct amount and location of the neighbor's land and your land. Does that the, make yeah. sense? Yeah, the assessor doesn't make mistakes like that. They generally they get it don't. Right. Yeah. They generally don't. The, the way to get around that, which I have seen once, is for the person claiming adverse possession to actually go to the assessor's office and kind of aggressively make an attempt and actually pay the taxes on the land that they want to claim. That's a hard thing to do. It requires a lot of things like the real owner is not paying taxes. The real owner doesn't right. object. I've seen it once. Okay. That's interesting. Because I would imagine that the real owner has to be notified that somebody's trying to do this. I don't know. I'm just guessing. <laughs> That's... Well, they, they have to have notice. And under the law, notice can be inferred or implied from the circumstances. Sure, sure. Actual notice is easy, right? You put a sign I up told saying, you. Yeah. I told you. But there's a lot of cases and examples where the outcome is you, you should have known because you could see it with your own eyeballs that somebody was out there using your land. And a reasonable person would have known that somebody was using okay. their property. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this concept of adverse possession would not apply. In this case that I started out with, you know, the neighbor discovers that your fence is on his property because I've not been paying the taxes all these years. Okay. So that if they don't work it out informally, what kind of solution would a court come up with? I'll tell you about a real case I'm handling right now. And there's two concepts. The first one is real, but very unusual. The concept of an agreed boundary. It's an old thing under the law that basically says if, if in the past, two property owners didn't know and couldn't reasonably figure out where the boundary was, they can have a handshake agreement about setting the boundary according to a fence. Simple example would be two ranchers out in the middle of the valley. They don't have a survey. They're using their eyes and say, hey, you know, this fence is here. That can be our boundary. If we can prove that they had that agreement by clear and convincing evidence, then that can set a boundary according to a fence. Okay. That is rare. I've dealt with those cases, but it's rare. So the more likely scenario is the person who's using your land will make arguments not for adverse possession, but for types of easements. Okay. And an easement is different from ownership. An easement gives you a right to use somebody else's land, but you don't actually own you their property. Own yeah. They might say that they have what's called a prescriptive easement, which is similar to adverse possession, 
more likely they'll say that they have what's called an equitable easement, which means they're asking the court in, in equity or in fairness to just, and I'm oversimplifying, but they're saying to the judge, hey, just look at this thing. Come on now, what's fair? Isn't it fair if I keep get to keep doing the thing I've been doing? And what? it's no skin off the other person's back. That argument works a lot, actually, because judges don't want to do unreasonable things. Sure. And this goes back to what's happening on the other side of the fence. How difficult would it be Wait. for the user who doesn't own the land to stop doing that? Do they have part of their house there? That would make it very difficult. Do they have nothing there? So it's really not that hard. Those are the types of factors that a judge will consider. Each case is unique. It does depend on the facts. It often depends on the testimony from the people involved. And mm -hmm. these are cases that get decided by judges. So the judge will weigh all that. Who do I believe? What's fair? And in some circumstances, could I fashion a result that is fair to both sides? So the person who has been using the land gets to keep doing it. The person whose land that they discovered is taken, what do they get? They'll probably get money. Okay, that was going to be my next question. Would the judge also say, yeah, I'm going to let you keep using it, but you got to pay? If it is an equitable easement, the court is required to make the, the user, to the person equity. who wants the easement, yeah. to do equity to pay for the reasonable value of the land that they're taking. What's okay. that value? That's where you get an appraiser involved, and that person will say, it could be as simple as it's this many square feet of this property, which is worth X, so just do the math. It could be more complicated saying... It's this percentage of the property, but the land is actually not that great, so it doesn't have value, or maybe the land is already subject to a bunch of other easements. All of those factors get considered by an appraiser, and, and ultimately, the court will decide how much money the, the user has to pay in order to keep and use the easement. Okay. All right. So sort of related to this, I, I do want to talk to you about, there was that recent case at the base of Mount Diablo with the bicyclists who had been using a shortcut between two public roads that went across somebody's property. And apparently that had been going on for years. And the owner decided to put a fence across the shortcut, thereby, you know, thwarting the bicyclists. And of course, the bicyclists were not happy, assuming there was a lawsuit commenced by the bicyclists. And uh, just kind of wondering what you think about a case like that. And, and we hear about these kinds of cases, oftentimes, involving access to a beach through private yep. property. It's a similar kind of case. It's a very similar kind of case. And uh, full disclosure, I have a little bit of bias with that litigation. I'm not directly involved in it, but in a prior <laughs> life, I was a bicyclist and, and I may have used that pass through dozens or hundreds of thousands of times. So, so there's that. I, I know it well. And I also know most of the attorneys who are involved in that litigation right now. And it's super interesting. The basic concept is if the public is using a right-of-way over time to get access from what point A to point B, and the right-of-way is through somebody's private property, what do they have to do to keep using it if the owner puts up a fence? And whether we're talking about a fence stopping people from using the most convenient path to the top of Mount Diablo or getting to a beach, and the beach examples are also in the news a lot, people, yeah. owners on the beach. In California, the public has a constitutional right to get right. to the beach and use the beach, but the question is, can, how do you get there and what's reasonable? Right, so there, that's a little bit different, the, the Mount Diablo case, because there's not a beach. There's not the a beach. The public does not have a constitutional right to access, well, they do Mount Diablo, but you know, it's a little bit different. The basic idea is, you're right, factually it's different, and but, but the basic idea is still the same. And yeah. in order for the public to establish a right to pass over somebody's property, the criteria aren't all that different. First, we have to show that it's been happening, and I'm oversimplifying, but first we've got to show it's been happening for a long time, and then we have to show that it's actually for the public benefit. And so one of the things that we litigators fight about in a case like that is, well, is it just one or two people trying to establish that right, or can we prove that it really is for the public good? And then we okay. talk about, is the alternative access path reasonable and, and fair enough? Is it really fair for the public to have a right to go through private property? Did the private property owner fail to do things that would have stopped uh, the use or mitigated the use? And that's probably why the fence went up. I, I don't know why the, the owner put up the fence. It's certainly an aggressive move. 
but they did it and they did it i think both for optics like there's literally a fence there and if you read our local paper there was a photograph a, an awesome photograph of the fence and a bunch of kids with bikes on the other side of the fence gripping it like they were being <laughs> like they imprisoned were in on the other side the <laughs> optics were great that of course is not the reality the reality is you can just bike around it it's it's a longer detour and it is less safe to ride on the public road oh, but okay. Ultimately, that mm, that case is going to depend on what's the nature of the use and is it really serving the public. So in the possible but unlikely event that somebody inherits a property that's subject to a claimed public use, you need to take steps to assess what is that use and perhaps have to take steps to stop it and then invite litigation to fight about who actually has that right. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to follow that case and see how it shakes out. I'm Definitely. For everybody, I'm sure, especially for someone like you. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm rooting for everybody just to have fun with it and make some good law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be good, too. OK, so another thing kind of related to the boundary dispute idea is the idea of a view interruption. You know, I have the uphill property and my neighbor down below me has let a big pine tree grow up into my view. Is there anything that I can do about that? Mm, depends on three things. The first question is, do you live in a place that has a view ordinance? Many, many cities in California do. Uh, the one I live in does. This actually came up. I bought my house and I've got a large tree in front. And when it has leaves, it does block part of my neighbor behind me's view. And uh, when I moved in, they very kindly said, hey, I, I think we want to cut that tree down a little bit because it's blocking our view. Have you seen the ordinance? And of course I said, well, I've read it and I'm also in this business. So let's have a discussion. And I never heard from them again. It was very strange. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes being a lawyer just kind of, you know. Sometimes it helps. Uh, but <laughs> so the first question is, do you have a view ordinance? And okay. many cities do, right? Sausalito, okay. San Francisco, Tiburon, the place I live up in the different part of the Bay Area has one. If you've got that, they usually say something like, the view shall not be uh, interrupted or infringed upon in an unreasonable way by the public or the private. So okay. key, key point, you may have a claim against the city for failing to maintain its trees. Um, and that's actually oh, yeah. what I'm dealing with right now. I have a tree owned by the city that's kind of blocking my view half the year and I'm thinking oh, about how to, in a non-litigious way, talk to the city about trimming it. And to your question about resolution, the first thing that I'll do is offer to pay myself to cut that tree down to a lower size because I don't want to create any more work for the, the city than, than I have. So that's okay. step one. Is there a view ordinance? Okay. Step two is, do you have an easement in your favor that protects your view? These are also not uncommon in the Bay Area. What that means is one property is at this point in the hill, one property is a little bit lower in the hill, and the one at the top says to the one at the bottom, I'll pay you money or I'll give you something of value in exchange for you putting an easement on your property that says now and forever in the future, you will not you block the block airspace. Mm. Right. So you won't let trees grow up. You won't let a house be built too high. No matter what happens, you're always going to keep that protected. Those okay. can be expensive. Those are useful because they protect views. And if that exists and it's violated, then you have a lawsuit uh, sure. uh, available you, to you and you, you can talk to a lawyer it. like me. And, well, and that could, you know, what you just described is the two property owners negotiated that. Right. Could that have been inserted into the, the legal description by the developer of the neighborhood in the beginning? Yes. Do you ever see that? Yeah, I do see okay. that. And that's not uncommon for a developer to have that kind of restriction put in either in a deed or what we call the CCRs. You know, if, if you own a house that's in any sort of subdivision, it probably has an owner, owner's association, which means it probably has CCRs. And if you've read them, they might have some rules and regulations in there that seem weird, things that you've never seen enforced. That could definitely have a view sure. restriction. Yeah. Uh, where I live, I, I don't have an you association, have an yeah. but I do have deed restrictions that the developer of this subdivision put in. And one of those happens to be a, what I would say is a redundant view ordinance, not ordinance, but a redundant it's view a, easement that's built a in. Covenant. Yeah. Yeah. A covenant that's been put there. So that can happen. And how you enforce those is a whole, whole other discussion, but they definitely exist. They definitely exist. Okay. But if you live 
in a place that does not have a municipal view ordinance and there's no covenant or easement attached to your property or your neighbor's property, are you out of luck? More likely than not, but there's that third option and and it's this. Can you prove that your neighbor is creating a nuisance or doing something to interfere with your enjoyment of your property? Oh. Right. So maybe there's no view ordinance, but they put up a row of very tall trees. Under California law, that t- row of tall trees could be what we call a spite fence. S P I T E. Okay. And if you play Wordle, that's a good Wordle word as well. Uh, <laughs> five spite letters. Fence, it's it's yeah. five letters, and and that's a real thing. Um, spite fence, or maybe they put in a huge uh, satellite antenna or cell phone tower right in front, and it blocks your view. You may not have a right to say that it blocks my view and that bothers me, but you may have the right to say, nevertheless, it's a nuisance. It's, it's a interfering nuisance. Interfering with my mm-hmm. with my ability to enjoy my property. Those cases are harder to prove. The basic test is always reasonableness. Is it reasonable for you to have a problem with that feature being there? And then we, we look around, like, where do you live? Well, if if I live in a remote place with no other houses around and my neighbor decides to plop down a cell, an- cell tower antenna right in front of my window where they could have put it anywhere else, probably not reasonable your your complaint is within yeah, but, reason yeah but if you live in a high density city that doesn't have a mun- uh, view ordinance and everybody's got stuff to deal with that's going to yeah. be a harder argument okay okay um let's go to our audience questions um okay the first one i i think you might have covered but the first question is how does title insurance it, factor, if at all, into boundary disputes. Maybe that's worth elaborating on a little bit. Well, generally speaking, it factors a lot. Even the most basic, basic of title insurance policies says you have coverage if somebody else claims a right to your title. So if you have your property and the neighbor comes forward and says, I have an easement across your land or my boundary is in a different location, probably that's going to to trigger coverage under the policy. Probably. Um, That's the basic level. Most, Most title insurance policies that are issued today have additional forms of coverage, including essentially fence coverage. And the fence coverage might have like a limitation of coverage, so five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars max. Mm-hmm. But a lot of policies have that, and it's a business decision by the insurance company because they said, "Look, everybody's got fence issues. It's not really something that's a title issue, but it's a piece of the product that the customer expects us to cover. So we will. We're we'll take that it. risk, and we'll we'll pay you a little money. So it it almost always factors into a boundary okay. dispute. And whether there's coverage will depend critically on the facts and usually when the claim came up. Did it exist before you bought the property or come up afterward? Okay. Okay. So that was a good question. All right. Um, Okay. There's one. What about paying for fences? Is there a rule about who pays to replace a fence between two yards? Yes. Oh, okay. there's, a rule, there's a rule and there's a statute. The California Civil Code has a statute that governs uh, governs what we call na- good neighbor fences. And the, the word good is actually in there. And forgive my distraction, but I want to find the code section or confirm the code section here while we're talking. <laughs> good neighbor. <laughs> yeah. I like that. So the good neighbor fence law, it's actually called that, and it's California Civil Code Section 841. That's what I was going to say, but I wanted to check. You got it right. Good. Uh, Civil Code Section 841, the short summary is if you have a fence between two properties or you want to have a fence between two properties, the owners have to equally pay for the cost of installation and maintenance of that fence. And if one doesn't want to participate, and it's reasonable that they should have to participate. The other one can incur that expense and sue the other one and get a lien against their property for the difference. That, it usually doesn't come to that. That's the basic concept, and it's written in such a way as to encourage people to problem solve on their own. And this is one of those statutes that I think was written with the idea that lay people, not you know, not unintelligent people, but just non-lawyers can read it and say, oh, okay, this is step one, this is step mm-hmm. two, this is how I do it. 
Where those cases end up with somebody like me is the question about, does the fence really need to be installed? Yeah. Does the fence really need to be replaced? You know, how, mm -hmm. how much does a fence need to be leaning on one side before it's reasonable before. to say that it needs to be fixed? And then, well... And how fancy does it need to be? How fancy does it have to be? Do you do you need that beautiful redwood with a two foot lattice? Are you okay with chicken wire? I don't know, but those are all the questions that come up. And yes, there is a law that governs this, and it's there to okay. have people avoid having to hire lawyers in the first instance. That's that that to me is makes this whole episode worthwhile just knowing that piece because i had no idea <laughs> yep yep it's it's there and uh, another point on that is if you live in a common interest development so a place with an hoa okay oftentimes the fences are the responsibility of the association oh, okay. so i've had cases where people go out and voluntarily they would say fix the fence, fix the but fence. what they're really doing is putting in something that they, that's aesthetically pleasing to them or doesn't follow the rules or is in a different location. And in addition to not having necessarily the right to do that, they may have also violated their association's and gonna, rules. Yeah. And the association was, they'll get yeah. in trouble and the association might have been the one responsible for that expense in the first place. So think about it. If you got $10,000 fence cost, you can either pay 100% of it or one 500th of it, assuming that there's 500 people in the association. Right, right, right. Yeah. So know, know, your, know your situation before you know start your situation. doing things. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, Stephen, this has been a very fascinating episode. I, I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I hope this has been useful for you and your viewers. And uh, I sincerely hope that if you ever have issues with neighbors or property ownership or boundaries, that you don't have to hire a lawyer like me to do anything other than just help you navigate that on your own in a constructive dialogue with, with your neighbor. Because when this is over, lawyers like me and Kirsten, we go away. We go home and enjoy our lives. We don't have to live with the people that you, you've been yeah. dealing with. That Your is neighbors so are there forever. So if you have a problem with them, even if the lawyer resolves the dispute, there's still tension. And the goal is to yeah. avoid that if we can. Yeah. You want to be good neighbor. You want to be the good neighbor. <laughs> if you can. Make nice if you can. Um, okay. Thank you all for joining us. My guest has been Stephen Kahn with Hogue Fenton, um, real estate expert and I am very delighted that you were here to see this and hear this and learn from him and as I did. And I look forward to connecting with you next time. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Absolute Trust Talk Live. If you enjoyed listening in, then don't forget to subscribe. You can find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you may listen by searching Absolute Trust Talk. While you're there, we would also love for you to leave us a review. And then why not share your favorite episodes with family, friends, or colleagues too? You can find all of our shows and corresponding show notes by visiting AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com. You'll also find a variety of other free resources, including our eBooks, videos, blogs, presentations, and more. If you need help with your estate planning or administration, we also offer a free discovery call to help get the process started. You can find more information on booking your session by visiting AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com slash scheduling. If you join us for the broadcast, you can submit questions during the show. But if not, don't worry. You can always get in touch with us by sending a quick message to info at AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you soon. This podcast is not meant to take place of legal advice from an attorney and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you do have a legal question or issue, please consult with an attorney.